Okay. All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Chu. Uh, I'm a professor at uh, the, the University of North Carolina Charlotte, and uh, my uh, student Jing Jay is uh, gonna and I are gonna be here talking about secure programming support in IDE. You know, we're at OWASP, so we all know software vulnerabilities is a big issue. Developers need to learn more. But our focus is a little bit more, it's going to be really focused on how to prevent errors by developers. And we all know that even the most experienced developers do make mistakes. So <coughs> from our perspective, that uh, today's uh, tool support for secure programming has really primarily focused on static analysis and dynamic analysis, which for the most part works like old compilers. You know, where it's, you, you run your analysis, you diagnose the problem, and you fix the problem. So they tend to be very reactive. So what we wanted to look at is how to proactively support programmers avoiding mistakes in the first place, uh, as opposed to fixing them retroactively. And, and by doing so, we want to include the developers in the security loop. So we started out by researching literature on uh, previous work in, in terms of you know, studies on why people make mistakes in programming, not just security mistakes, but programmers make bugs all the time. You know, we all have debugged. And uh, really, uh, uh, many of you probably know Donald Knuth, which is like one of the fathers of computer science. And he actually did a, a, a self-study on his own substantial programming activities and found out that mistake of omission is one of the largest class of mistakes. You know, just, it's not like he doesn't know, he just forgets to do things because there's so many things you have to worry about when you're programming. So that's an interesting insight for us. Uh, we also have done some study by interviewing professional developers, specifically in the context of secure programming, why people make security programming mistakes. And what we found, interestingly, is there's a disconnect between conceptual understanding. You know, m many of the programmers we interview, professional programmers, understand security, understand secure programming. That's important. I think that's sinking in. But they don't necessarily connect that context with what they're doing here. They often rely on you know, for example, some framework or process is going to take care of security for me. Uh, even for something basic as input validation, uh, they tend to focus more on the functional aspects and the business logic as opposed to from a security perspective. So our approach is sort of based on the assumption that many common software vulnerabilities are caused by mistake of omission. So for example, uh, failure to perform input validation or output filtering, just people forget. Uh, failure to check security invariance before performing critical uh, operations, for example, CSERF, broken access control. It's not they don't know, they just forget. And so what we want to do is we want to interactively identify those common security mistakes, uh, issues, and rely, you're using reliable heuristics and uh, warn the programmers in ID, pop up a warning and say, here's something you need to pay attention to, and we provide them with options to actually take actions. And specifically, we've identified two types of actions. One is what we call interactive code refactoring, and the other one is interactive code annotation. And I will give you a demo of the first type, or the prototype we implemented, and we'll talk about uh, the design for the second one later on in the talk. So the, so, the, so the design rationale is the whole tool is based on this idea of recognition instead of recalling. The idea is programmers have very heavy cognitive burdens. We want to help them to recognize problems as opposed to think about it cognitively. And using a, a, you know, this key uh, computer-human human -computer interaction principle, we want to take full advantages of uh, developers' application knowledge. They are programming in the context, they know the business logic, they know the application context, and we want to support secure software development best practices. For example, we've embedded OWASP ISAPI into our plugin so people can generate code, use, use ISAPI, latest version of ISAPI to validate their inputs or encode their uh, uh, variables. And we want this to be policy driven so this, none of this is hardwired into the program itself so that it can be changed to different environments. So the, the, the demo we're going to have is uh, what we call it ASIDE, stands for Application Security in IDE. Uh, it's based on uh, Eclipse Java. And uh, uh, basically, have the, the feature that's fully implemented is code refactoring. So I'm going to turn it over to Jing. She's going to so show you a demo. All right. So. Um
So a side, our side approach uh, aims to provide uh, developers secure programming practice support uh, during the program construction. And our demo comes with uh, a savvy validator and enco encoder as uh, an example of such pro practices. Um, and here's how a site works. Uh, once the site is installed as a, a plugin um, to Eclipse, you can run, run it against a project by right clicking on the project's name in the Explorer view, uh, Project Explorer view, and then navigate to a site menu. So based on the preference setting of a site, which can be viewed through um, Eclipse preference dialog, um, a site will identify vulnerable code in the project source code uh, using predefined rules. So as you can see here, um, the default aside rule setting uses uh, the default trust boundaries from the plugin aside. Um, but these rules can be extended for um, uh, as uh, at your will, as you would see later. So right now, if I click OK, and so to 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 make eSavvy uh, more easily available to developers, um, a site actually does eSavvy configurations automatically the very first time you run a site. And, all, and these configurations include um, copying the eSavvy libraries into, into the lib folder under under the project and also put, putting those uh, libraries onto the project's class path and also um, generating copies of all the configuration files uh, uh, of ISABI. And then once the site finds uh, a match in, in the source code, uh, it will mark the code with a warning and also highlight the code. As you can see here in this uh, transaction servlet, there are four parameters that retrieve the string from HTTP request um, through the method invocation get parameter, and this is actually a common resource, a common source for untrusted inputs. Uh, that's a side warns you um, immediately um, after invoking this function in your code. So if you delete the function or the statement the warning will go away. But aside doesn't just stop here. If you hover over the highlighted code or uh, click over, click on the uh, warning, you will get a, I'm not sure whether you can see it. So you will get this uh, explanation view as well as a list of input types that are um, coded in the ISABI, um, ISABI properties files and validation files. So through, through this explanation view, you'll get an idea of what the problem is. For instance, why the code is vulnerable and uh, what consequences you may have if you don't take care of them and uh, well, how can you go approach and fix the problem. So if you want to roll out of your own solutions, no problem. You can go ahead and write your own code to address the pro to, to address the warning. Um, and aside doesn't stop you from doing that. But aside also can also provide you um, the code generation uh, mechanism to generate code for you to deal with to address the warning. And it's very easy. All you need to do is to select a an appropriate input type from the list of from this list and just click on that. So for instance, for this doc name variable, I'll just um, go ahead and choose, say, sift string. And this is a rule from Isabi. And if I click on that, a segment of code will be generated. And this code actually employs Isabi's uh, validators get valid input API to validate the, this stock name. And this code, generic code, is just like the other code, which, can, which is subject to modification. You can uh, put your own exception handling code here. And as you may notice that after I, 
Upon my selection of one of the solutions from the list, this warning disappears. So if I undo this process, the warning will show up again. Sometimes, but sometimes um, untrusted inputs are encapsulated in, uh, in, in some sort of composite data type such as data structure and rather than a primitive data type such as string. So it's, it's only reasonable when, when uh, it's only reasonable to warn developers when the untrusted input gets, gets extracted from the data structure. Um, and that's how a site does it. So, um, for instance, this uh, request.get parameter map is a very good example. So we first, let me see, <coughs> comment, use these instead of uh, the invocations of get parameter to retrieve the parameters from the, um, from the HTTP request. Since a size default trust boundary policy do not cover uh, request.get per, uh, parameter map this, this, this uh, method invocation, so uh, you need to extend the, pol the, the default rules by to add your own ones. So to that end, all you need to do is to right click on the project and you go navigate to a site and then you add a site rules. A site will create a folder named a site rules um, under your project. And all the rules are written in um, H XML uh, and this trust boundaries.xml file is where you need to put the rules in. So for the sake of time, I've already prepared the rules for a get parameter map. So I'll just copy this <coughs> paste in and save it. And then all you need to do is to tell a side that you, you want to use the uh, rules that you just created by going to the preference setting and then you say, okay, I want to use trust boundaries from the project under detection and then you click OK. And then a site responds to the change by identifying vulnerable code by using both the default policies and also the extended ones that you just created. And now you can see that the map, the method invocation map.get um, are, are marked as vulnerable because it's, it's where you get the untrusted input. So this code is actually is similar to the ones we, we saw for our get parameter. If you delete them, the warnings will the warnings will go away. And also, if you hover over, you will get a list of uh, input types as well as actually here. See, you will see the explanation view. And instead. Besides input validation, a set also supports um, output encoding uh, by identifying, you know, places where um, the application content content gets output to software like web browsers. Here's an example at this line that this um, the application uh, variable part out is rendered to a web browser, which is a very common indicator of process scripting vulnerability. So uh, when you hover over or click on the icon, you will get a list of encoding strategies from a SAPI. And if you, for instance, for this case, I will choose HTML encoding, and then you will, the, the code will be generated, uh, the, the encoding code will be generated to address the warning. So uh, besides, Input validation and out output encoding, we also, uh, ASAD also provides a feature, what we call um, secure coding on demand service. So it's for um, variables or untrust inputs uh, that are not identified by a side automatically because of all kinds of reasons, for instance, lacking trust boundary uh, rules. Um, so for cases like that, you all you need to do is to select, for instance, this one, you just select this variable and then right click and you will see in the context menu, you will see a menu items at SAPI validator and then the sub menu items are the rules 
that can be extracted from is SABI for your validation. For instance, um, I'm going to choose safe string. So, and this will generate the same the same code routines that does the validation. And and this is all I have for the demo. With that. Okay. Thank you. All right, so as you can see that, uh, so we, we, we put in the programmer support, so the idea is we want to make it as easy as possible for the developers to do the right thing, okay? And uh, uh, sort of we, in our work, we identify there's at least two different strategies for doing input validation. One strategy is you perform input validation right before a critical operation, like you're putting stuff into the database. Uh, or, you know, writing things to the browser uh, uh, HTTP stream. Uh, the advantage of that approach is you know exactly what you're doing because this is, this is the last chance you can validate or encode something. Uh, the disadvantage is you, you, may, you may have to do redundant validations. For example, you get one input and it goes into two different database tables and then you get two different warnings as I'm sure many of you have seen those in, in, in warnings generated by, by say, something like uh, uh, Fortify. And then, uh, and also, uh, you, you may fail to validate because it's it may be difficult to foresee all the critical operations. Today, this set of operations is critical, and then tomorrow maybe something else is, and then and that's this strategy is going to uh, not be able to catch catch that. The alternative strategy is you validate something as soon as it comes in, and then and then you say, well, you know, no matter where it goes, then I know what what the input is, right? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the advantage of that approach is you have developers' attention right then and there, make the right choice, but the disadvantage is it can lead to some false positives because some, some things may never go anywhere and then you ask for validation anyways. Uh, and then it does not, sometimes does not work well with dependency injections, uh, uh, some of these things, because you don't know where the input is coming from. So, a site really can handle both strategies, all right? So, uh, uh, and, and we have experimented with different versions looking at different things. And uh, uh, we've done some evaluations of a site for the refactoring part against a, 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 an open source project using uh, Fortify as our benchmark. And uh, the details are in the in, in, in a paper, which I will give you a link later on you can look at. But uh, uh, just, to summar, just to give you some additional ideas. So once you have this, then uh, this is not currently fully implemented, but this I think is a very good idea that shows that this input validation is very different from the current, say for example, filter-based input validation because you're closer to the application context. You're not doing it outside of your application. You know, uh, before you hit the, 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 the for example, semantic uh, validation. So once you've, let's say, for example, identify uh, 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 an input variable as a, as, as, as a file path, okay, then you can have an option to say maybe limit it to a particular directory, all right? So, 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 so as an example, that you, you can have a lot more semantics that's specific for the application and you can, uh, you can add more security protection for that, so, uh, uh, so, so I just want to point that one out. And, and, and as I said, we've uh, evaluated this against Apache Rolla, which uh, is a full-fledged uh, blog server uh, with 65K lines of code, more than 65,000 lines of code. And we did a you know, simple Google search on powered by Apache Rolla, and then 1.8 million entries came up. So there's a lot of things out there that use this uh, uh, as, as a, um, as, as, as a tool and then as a platform and then we uh, benchmarked against Fortify SCA and then the result is, uh, is published in a paper which is referenced, uh, I'll give you a link to this, you can, you can get that. And uh, uh, John is not here but uh, one of the co-authors of that paper is John Melton, uh, he's uh, uh, one of the project leads at the uh, AppSensor project. So uh, uh, John actually did a uh, benchmark using his company, he was working at that time for a, a large financial service company as a software security auditor, and he used his company's best practice as a benchmark to analyze Rolla using Fortify, and then we benchmarked the results of that against a site and see what sort of uh, results we get. And, and in the interest of time, I do want to uh, cover some of the more sort of interesting research uh, ideas. So I'm going to skip some of these things. You know, this is what uh, uh, Fortify found. And uh, the, 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 the thing I want to take away is 
vast majority of the errors that Fortify generated for uh, uh, for uh, this Apache Aurora uh, input validation, output encoding kinds of stuff. And, and by the way, John thought that program was sort of average quality, it's not particularly good, it's not certainly bad, he's seen much worse than that. So vast majority of the, probably more than, about close to 60% of the problems are those input validation and output encoding errors. And 90% of those, aside, could just take care of right away. So in other words, if you use a side, you could have solved all these problems before you hit static analysis. You know, all these things will be done. Incidentally, there was a, a university challenge yesterday. Uh, you know, our team, we fielded a team from UNC Charlotte. We uh, won the defense part. We didn't, unfortunately, we didn't win the, the overall competition, but we won the defense part. And, and the judges were arguing which part is more important. So I let, let, the, let this uh, uh, to other people. But the interesting thing is we actually used a side against two web applications they wanted us to defend. And Asai found like 30, more than 30 uh, vulnerabilities, and we used this mechanism, we're talking about that, to just very quickly wipe out those, those sort of low-handing fruits. So, so, so I think Asai is particularly effective sort of handling these kinds of things as its current prototype implementation just can take care of these things very, very quickly. Uh, but I, want, I do want to talk a little bit about false positives. So we did some false positive analysis. So aside reported more than 118 taint sources that, because in our current, this ver version, we, we, we track taint sources. More than 118 taint sources uh, than Fortify did, okay? Uh, so, uh, but we, we did sort of analysis on all these cases. We find that 94 of, the, uh, of them are what we would determine as potentially exploitable. Uh, and, and you can make a very strong argument, and we do, uh, as a best defense in depth practice, you should validate them anyways. Uh, there are, however, 24 false positives. So I'll give you an example of something that we think is a good thing to do as a defense in depth strategy. I would like to hear your take on it. Here's a snippet of code where there's an error, an exception was thrown, and uh, as a parameter to the exception handling routine, uh, the code has request.get URL, all right? Now this URL could have, could have a JavaScript in it. And uh, what, what uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, Fortify did not flag it because I suppose this URL didn't go anywhere. The, or this exception handling didn't do anything. But this could be, you know, be the entry point for something like log poisoning. So, 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 so we think this is a good practice, especially when there's, you know, very little overhead. You just click and generate some HTML encode code that, 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 that would sort of prevent those kinds of things from happening as your software evolves. And, uh, but there, it does have some uh, uh, false positives as the 24 cases. So for example, in this case, the code reads in a parameter, and that parameter is either going to be true or false. It's a Boolean test. So in all likelihood, this is probably harmless. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, but because we handle taint sources, we'll flag that as well. So, so there are some false positives. Uh, so just to quickly summarize uh, the portion of uh, the code refactoring, and, and, and specifically within the context of the demo, is uh, uh, you know, we're trying to address validation and coding issues at the time of development. Uh, requires no specialized training. We do not assume developers know static analysis or anything like that. Everything is in situ in the browser, in, 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 in the in IDE. Uh, we want to be able to best capture application context. Uh, we want to save time fixing vulnerabilities that may be found as opposed to coming back to fix it later as in most current best practices. Uh, and that uh, we find it to be very effective. Vast majority of those errors we could, we could actually uh, uh, detect and uh, uh, save. And we can save quite a bit of time in terms of, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, in terms of uh, workload for the auditors. So for example, not, uh, about, about 1,000 out of uh, 3,400 warnings Fortify would generate we could have taken care of uh, at the development time. Uh, so some practical implications for aside. We, we believe that uh, a tool like that can be a very good complement to static analysis. Uh, so you can generate, you know, clean, uh, for example, you can generate cleansing rules. You know, that's one of the big problems for, for weeding out, uh, uh, you know, warnings from static analysis is, you know, how do you know that something has already been cleansed? Uh, one of the things that Asai can do, because the developer has taken certain actions, you can generate some cleansing rules, and that could be as an input 
to your security auditing people and say, oh, you know, somebody has already done that, so I don't have to worry about it. Okay, so I think that's that could be a, a, a value add, and it could also be used as sort of a light version of static analysis, taking care of some of the basic vulnerabilities without having to invest in a full-blown static analysis, and I think that is also of value. So now I have, uh, uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the issues I think we want to take this idea of supporting ID a little bit further and looking at some more interesting vulnerabilities. And, and, and this is, you know, uh, uh, stepping more in the research volume, uh, uh, domain. We have not fully implemented that there. So, so again, going back to our premise, what we're trying to do is to remind developers of potential security issues and, 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 and uh, encourage them to take some actions. So, um, uh, so, so, uh, so the second mechanism that we're going to talk about is called interactive code annotation. And I want to first off by saying that you know, annotation is not a new idea, but the way we are using annotation in this context is different from traditional annotation because traditional annotation are, stat, are text based. You, you, you write certain sort of extra syntax. Uh, 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 program statements essentially in the program, right? So the kinds of uh, annotation we're talking about, the interactive annotation, it's, first of all, it's not text-based. Uh, the focus is not about asserting a, something about a piece of code, but to talk about security relationships between different parts of the code, which is very different from the traditional annotation, which just talks about locally what this uh, uh, piece of code does. And, and it's entirely, we envision it to be entirely point-click based, so no extra syntax or anything like that is needed. So this is what we're talking about. Because we find this is people often misinterpret when they see annotation, oh, you know, developers don't like to do annotation. And, and we wanted to make it really easy and, and, and hopefully that there is value add, as I will show you later on. So let me give you a motivating example, uh, sort of a, a simple, very simple online banking kind of uh, uh, example. So if you have a user, username, role, first name, last name, you have accounts, have account number, transactions, you have transaction IDs that are tied to particular accounts, and then you have a relationship between account number and username, right? So, so it's sort of very, standard, the simplest sort of set of database for, for tracking those transactions. So here's a, sort of a, a, our current mock design of this process. So as you're writing code, uh, uh, you, you see that this line in this particular case, I don't know whether I, you, can, you can see this or not, but what this, the red line highlights is a routine, a, a method call that eventually accesses one of those tables. Now we, the assumption is, you know, you, you work in an organization with an SSG. I'm assuming people know about BSIM and SSGs, right? So, so, so your security auditor says these tables are really critical. Access control, you know, needs to be applied to those tables. Let's say, for example, all right? So, what we do is we say, okay, this call is going to have access to one of those tables, and we're just asking the developer at that time and say, where is your ex access control logic? Show me where is your access control logic. So the developer maybe at this point scroll up to this green line and says, okay, here's my access control logic. And that's what I mean by interactive annotation, which is you are, you are, you are relating different parts of the code. Here's a part of the code that does uh, database access, and here's a part of the code that does access control check. And uh, from a programmer, program perspective, we have no idea where the logic is, but the, the developer knows what it is, right? Hopefully. So what we're trying to do is inside ID to bring out those relationships and capture them, all right? And uh, uh, so, so, so two questions immediately comes up is where to ask questions, because there's so many different places you can ask the questions. And second is what is a valid validation? So this is my, our current answer based on that. We think that Ask the question at the level of you know, database access, like SQL statements, is probably too low level because you can have library routines that are called by different threats, right? Different transactions. And it may be two different levels. So, so the, to the right level, in, in our judgment right now, is at what use case level, at transaction level. So you know, you, 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 let's say you're in a, in a web application, then this is what the user sees at the high level is transaction. So for example, you know, it's a, it could be a Java servlet or some kind of an action, any, any kind of an MVC framework, you have this controller, high level controller that comes in. That's where you want to ask the question. 
So that's, a, that's uh, the first, first point. The second point is what is a valid annotation? And, 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 and sort of theoretically what this annotation is is really about parts of an invariant, a security invariant. So it's fundamentally a logic test. It's got to be some sort of a Boolean test. So, okay, it's a Boolean test. Or uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a different syntax, for example, something like spring security, it might be an assertion, but the assertion is really implemented as a, as a logic test anyway. So, so fundamentally, it's a logic test. So that's the first thing is it has to be a logic test, and it must be on the execution path from the web entry to your database access. So somebody just sort of clicks something randomly, we at least do some sanity check to see if, if the check, you know, if, if your annotation is actually gonna do anything for, your ex, for, for, for this critical path, okay? Now armed with that information, we can actually do some very interesting analysis based on that, and I think those kinds of analysis are not currently being done, uh, at least uh, out of the box in static analysis. So for example, Here's your web entry, and here's your database access, and we ask the developer, where's your access control logic, You're using this as an example. So this, this, this wiggly thing here is where the logic test that the developer says, here, this is where I did my, my uh, access control. Now, we actually have no idea whether this is accurate, is, is sufficient, I mean, we're not getting that, all right? We just say, okay, looks like it's a, it's a Boolean test, it's on the path from the, the entry to the, uh, database access point, so we think it's, you know, I assume you did a good job. But then we can do some analysis, path analysis in the code. If we find that there's another path on which there is no annotation at all, then we can know for sure there's a broken access control, right? Because you, you, you told me this is where your access control point is, but I found another path that, that you could get to the data. So, so we can do some, it should, certainly these are not complete, but they are sufficient. What we find is probably bugs, but you know, we cannot find everything, obviously, okay? This is another interesting case. I'll give you an example later on. That let's just suppose you have two different transactions, two different use cases, and you ask the developer, and they may be written by two different people or different teams, and you ask for annotation. They all access the same data table, but they have different annotations. Now, I think it's really interesting to point out, at least, to the development team, there's some discrepancy. Is this really true? Maybe one of them should, should be, extra check should be done, or, or what, all right? So, so that's another example, and actually have a, have a concrete example to show you that one as well. So, so how is that gonna really work in, in, in practice? So we apply this technique to uh, two uh, open source projects, Rolla, which is the one we, we did analysis on. We also apply this on Moodle, which is a PHP-based course management system, which is phenomenally popular in the university community. And uh, so we, 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 we did that, and we uh, used uh, uh, statistics, your bug track security patches from those open source projects, and we found that in Rolla there were six reported security patches, Three of them are sort of the input validation, output filtering type, which all can be handled by a side in the, as is the prototype implementation. There is one broken authentication that can be caught by this annotation approach, and I'll give you this, the details. Moodle has 14 security patches. One of them is in the uh, validation and encoding space. Two of them are CSERF, right? And that could be caught by code annotation. And I'll give you these, uh, these examples in detail, so, so hopefully you can see how, how this might work. So this is the, the, our reconstructed uh, uh, logic uh, flowchart for, for, uh, for a, uh, 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 a use case in Apache uh, Rollup. So, so you have a web entry point and say, well, it, are the web headers valid? Right? If it's yes, you retrieve the credentials. Are the credentials valid? And if it's yes, you, you let it access the database. And if not, you throw an exception. But there is also a path where it says, if the header is no, somehow it wiggles through the code and, and have access to the database. I'm sure you know things like that happen. We've seen this in, in, in the wild. And, and so what we would have done is we would have, here's the, the do get method in which leads to the database access point. And according to our rule, we would ask a question of line 52 because this routine, this method call eventually accesses uh, the, uh, the database, right? And then the, 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 the developer will be, in this case, uh, suppose that, you know, uh, following the logic, there were actually two checks for user ID and password that says, this is my access control logic, 
right? So they can annotate that here in this part of the code. But what we found was through this analysis that there's another path from the entry point to the database so we can uh, produce a warning as to this is a, a potential broken access control problem. So similar idea can be applied to CSERF protection. So uh, here's an example of changing an existing user's profile in Moodle. So Moodle is, is a very complicated role-based access control system because you think about course management systems. You have TAs, you have professors, you have students, you have system administrators, you, people can post grades and you know so so and it actually has to comply with you know, FERPA and then the privacy regulations. So, so this is a very complicated uh, multi uh, uh, role based access control model. So one of the things you do is have a user profile, right? So this is a classic CSERF attack against some professor's user profile. Let's say, for example, a student wants to change the grade. So what you do is here's your, now we sort of cast this in from PHP to Java terms because we don't have this written in PHP. So, so we sort of say, well, what we would have done if, if we had this in Java? So this is your, 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 your PHP file. Uh, uh, and then later on, you know, this highlighted uh, line is eventually wind up to call a routine that accesses the database, right? So we, we, we define the set of databases. And it changes the, 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 the uh, user profile. So the, the heuristic we would apply, the simple rule we would apply to uh, deal with CSERF is whenever a web form submission contains an operation to update some database, some state of the server, then we would ask for annotation on CSERF protection logic. Just a reminder, hey, it looks like this web, uh, this web form is, is doing something to the state. Where is your CSERF protection logic? And the programmer is going to have to you know, do something. In this case, you know, probably we'll ask this question in line 30, uh, 72, and then we'll, we'll pop this question. Now, uh, it, OK, uh, there was a, somehow a slide missing here. But well, I'll, I'll just talk through it. What happens is, in the, in the case of Moodle developers, they obviously knew CSERF protection really, really well. They have design special routines and patterns to prevent CSERF. All right, so this is a very mature open source project. But even that, two cases, in two cases, the developers forgot to add the CSERF protection routines in. So later on, they would have to issue security patches to patch them up. So we found those out. So these are real cases. So if we had, you know, our theory is, if we had asked that question to the developer at that point, where's your CSERF protection logic? And the developer said, oh, you know, I forgot. So you know, here's what I put in. So that goes back to our theory is we're, we're trying to use this warning to, as, as a way to uh, help people to avoid obvious mistakes. So here's another one, delete a post, and uh, uh, same, same kind of a problem, that, that there was no CSERF protection at all. And this is what we call triangulation. This is uh, an, another open source project. This was uh, first reported in, 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 at a, in a security conference uh, last year. That uh, uh, what, what this, interestingly, what this paper was trying to do, this research was trying to do, is they're trying to take uh, a source code of, of, a, of a web application and perform dynamic analysis to find out bugs, all right? And then so what you need to do is you need to give it sort of normal use cases and it'll find security invariants. It will hypothesize security invariants and see whether it do it. And I think uh, Professor Giovanni Wigner from UC Santa Barbara is, is, is the team that's doing that. Uh, I think he has a company is trying to build this tool as well. So, 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 so I think this is being, uh, I don't know exactly what the status of it, but, but I know he was at the last year's AppSec USA, so he was talking about this. Okay, so this is a case that he, he pointed out as using dynamic analysis by comparing two different transactions and find out that, you know, in one transaction here you have two invariants, in another transaction you have one, and then you can point out as a potential broken access control problem. All right, as, 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 as a power of dynamic analysis. What we're saying is we could have done the same thing, at least in this case, with static analysis, but with a little bit of help from the user. So that's very interesting. So if the programmer, if indeed the overhead of, of uh, annotation is fairly light and the, users don't, the programmers don't mind doing that, they can provide some input 
to us, to the, to the development process, where we can actually find out these things without having to do dynamic analysis, we can do static analysis, which is, you know, I thought it was, from a research perspective, extremely interesting, so I, I throw this thing in there. Uh, and we did sort of a, a very uh, 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 quick analysis of SAN's top 25 dangerous programming errors, and we say, okay, we've got these two approaches, interactive code refactoring and interactive annotation. What sort of things that we might be able to help? And so we identified things that, you know, this might have some impact. I mean, it doesn't solve all problems in all cases, but at least in some aspect that one of these approaches could have helped. Uh, so let me just sort of quickly summarize what we see as the benefits for for this approach. And I want to talk about it at three different levels. There's the, the students, uh, uh, because you know, we, as we said at the very beginning, education is very important. Most universities don't train people enough in secure programming. So being in an academic institution, we care about training the next generation of programmers. So we want to look at students. We want to look at professional developers. And we also want to think a little, a, little, a little bit in terms of the enterprise perspective. So for students, what we have found is code refactoring, code annotation really helps to shape awareness. If you say, you know, like in our universities, in many universities, people teach Java and then use Eclipse as the IDE. If we put a site in there and then students go through four years and they, they see these things, so at least they get input validation output encoding right, right? I mean, among other things, okay? So we think this is gonna make a difference. The other thing is uh, uh, professors generally are very busy and they don't grade on the code really for most part. I mean, I'm, some of you are teaching part-time, I'm sure, or even full-time, that you know, we don't always grade the code, we just test if the code works. And if it works, okay, that's fine, right? We do some functional testing. Uh, let alone secure programming. So, but, but with this, these approaches, we can actually single out generate a report to faculty and say, hey, you know, this student, is, 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 is the student paying attention to security, right? So, so there's some indication that, that we can train students better. For professional developers, again, the premise is a reminder of security programming practices. In the case of code refactoring, it can sort of do some of the grunt work for you. So let's say you want to do ISAPI and using anti-SAMI, and it's pretty complicated. I have to read the documentation etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But with a side, anti-SAMI is right there because it's part of ISAPI. You just click on it, boom, it's there. Right? So, so it, it, it reduces the, the, the workload of doing the right thing. Uh, for code annotation, we think that the hypothesis is, uh, you know, these advanced analysis can be very helpful in terms of detecting some more subtle errors. Uh, we think the enterprise also benefits. Uh, uh, for example, you can push out standard libraries, right, as, as Jing has showed you that our rules are, can be extended. So you can write your own rule sets, you can write your own libraries and, and install them in, in a plugin, so they want to make sure that everybody who touches code will do the same thing, right? And you can collect statistics, you know, whether people are complying with it, and maybe there's good reason for not doing certain things, but if there are, then you want to find out what these are. Uh, also, the code annotation, uh, in addition to helping you with collecting, you know, SDLC statistics, is, is can aid in code review. So today, you know, you, your code reviewers to typically use your Fortify or something. You run this for, against Fortify, and, uh, but, but you really don't have the application context. So for example, you're accessing a database. Where is the access control logic? Where is the CSERF protection? Uh, you have to read the code to find out. I mean, unless you have the de developer sitting right next to you, and if he or she remembers, you know, one month afterwards that what he or she did with the code, it's very difficult to do. Whereas with the annotation, if you can open up the file and, and, and retrieve, say, oh, okay, here it is. So at least you have some, some, some way of doing more in-depth analysis for some really critical pieces of code. So we actually did some user studies, right? This is all, you know, okay. Uh, what real people think about it. So we did a user study on 15 graduate students and 10 professional programmers. I don't really have time to go into the details, but, uh, but, but overall people generally notice the, uh, the warnings. They like this approach, but uh, professional, it works really well with students. The developers uh, are more skeptical. They, they sort of, uh, they have, they're sort of 
burning their genes, they want to get the functionality first, so they don't always pay as much, much, much attention to it. And uh, so there's, there's, it's, it's a little bit more subtle with developers, but overall it's very positive. And then obviously, you know, this is a prototype design. We, we need to improve that. So uh, we, we talk about this more in the paper. Uh, so, so in way of conclusion, because I have about three minutes, that uh, uh, so we've introduced two mechanisms, interactive code refactoring and annotation. Uh, we think it can be effective addition to the best practice SDLC, preventing some vulnerable, uh, you know, basic vulnerable code from being written, and, uh, and also improve the efficiency of static analysis. Uh, what we're doing right now, one of the thread of the, uh, 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 one fork of this project is uh, we got a, a grant from National Science Foundation just to uh, sort of use a, a side in university curriculum, particularly introduction to programming classes. So we're doing that and then we will hopefully have some results to report next year. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, improvements are needed to make it more useful for uh, developers. So future work, you know, UI design, we have to look at support frameworks. I think we have most of the work already there, but, but, but we have to think about some, there's some corner cases we still have to cover. Uh, makes, uh, you know, make a site appeal to the professional developers. That's why we're here talking to you all and uh, uh, get, get your input. Uh, and, uh, and thank you very much. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the National Science Foundation for giving us the funding to do this work. I uh, want to thank Fortify for giving us an education license so that we can do the analysis and benchmark. Uh, and your input above all, it's just like a minute or so, we can ask a, take a couple of questions. And here's the link. All the papers are available, and you can take a look at that.